Uh, but I want to share with you another challenge that Mike and I are going to be a part of just now in front of all of you. And this is what we're calling a laugh challenge. Uh, maybe you've seen something like this on the internet, but basically what we are going to do is read a cheesy joke to each other, and then whoever laughs loses. All right, you game? Okay, we're going to do it, whether you're game or not. All right, so we're going to share a, a joke, and then whoever laughs again loses. You want to start, man? Sure. Let's do it. <clears throat> All right. So did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? No. Great food, no atmosphere. <laughs> All right, I lost. All right, point for you. Good job. Why was the little strawberry, little strawberry crying? I don't know. His mom was in a jam. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yes. They, they chopped her up in case you didn't get it and stuck her in the jelly. I like that one. That was good. Uh, what do you call a fake noodle? An impasta. Oh, yeah. man, that's good. Dude, that's good. You should have said that last service. How do you befriend a squirrel? I don't know. Just act like a nut. <laughs> that was good. Uh, do you want to hear a joke about paper? Yeah. Never mind. It's terrible. Oh. Yeah. Good one. <laughs> All right. Uh, why did the jaguar eat the tightrope walker? I have no idea. <laughs> it was craving a well balanced meal. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Finish Very this nice. up with a good one, man. All right, all right. Um, why did the coffee file a police report? I don't know. You tell me. It was mugged. Oh, <laughs> yeah, man. Dude, you got me on this one. Nice one. Man, you really stepped up your game. For I my had to bring the he killed me last service. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, just as an example, I'll give you my favorite. Um, what, do you, what do you call a guy with a rubber toe? Roberto. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So. Hey, you, you've seen these challenges take place online. Some of them are laugh challenges. Obviously, I, I would say almost all of you have probably seen the, the ice bucket challenge. You, that, that benefited ALS. You have some other things like a red pepper challenge, I think, or a hot pepper challenge that's out there, the Disney challenge. Um, and, then, and then there are many, many others, and you can research them to find them. And those, those challenges are fun. But... As we come here today, we all walk in here with certain challenges that in no way would we describe them as fun. Those are the types of challenges that the people in our church are wrestling through right now. The type of challenge that a woman in our church who has been uh, battling for her marriage for many years but now is in the middle of a divorce. That's the type of challenge she is facing. It's the type of challenge that a man in our church who is going through a life-threatening illness while he's raising his teenage kids. It's the type of challenge that a young couple goes through as they're dealing with infertility. It's the kind of challenge that you go through when you're a part of a job that you don't like. It's the kind of challenge that you go through when you work for a boss that you really don't respect. It's the kind of challenge that you go through when you're caring for a aging parent or a parent whose health is deteriorating or a spouse whose health is deteriorating. It's the kind of challenge you go through when you deal with unemployment, when you're a little light on money, um, you're, you, you aren't making ends meet, when you're struggling with being single, when you're struggling with being married, whenever you're just struggling in life. Those are the types of challenges that we wouldn't describe as being fun. Today we're going to talk about how to deal with life's challenges. A common metaphor that's been used when it comes to challenges or problems we face is a storm. And I believe that it's a very appropriate metaphor that can be used for the challenges that we go through. You'll hear a phrase often get used, the storms of life. 
You're going through a storm in life. In Acts chapter 27, as we come to this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is on a ship, and he is going to encounter a great storm. But the writer of the book of Acts, Luke, he is in no way writing an allegory. In other words, he's not writing a story that's fictional to make a different point or make a a deeper point. He's writing an historical event that that took place. But out of that historical event, as we see how Paul deals with this challenge and how he deals with this storm, I think that we can learn some lessons that will help us as we go through the challenges that we deal with in life. I've learned some lessons from this to help me deal with the challenges that I deal with. Now, let me to catch you up to Acts chapter 27 so we're all on the same page. Paul was in prison for two years by a man named Felix. Felix was eventually replaced by a man named Festus. Festus wanted to rule justly on Paul's case, but he didn't have enough evidence to do so. And so he decided to move the case to Jerusalem. Well, Paul knew that nothing good awaited him in Jerusalem. If you read the previous chapters to 27, you find out that there was even an ambush that was being planned if he were to travel to Jerusalem. And so Paul, being a Roman citizen, appeals to Caesar. And Festus says, if Caesar is who you desire to see, then Caesar is who you will see. And so he places him on a ship, and he sets, and the ship sets sail for Rome. But along the way, it, it begins to encounter difficult weather. It's sometime in, in September. We aren't exactly sure the precise date of when they started, but it's sometime in September. It's a very difficult time to travel in this part of the world at this particular time. And so they lose time, and they find themselves in a harbor, a port called Fair Havens. And it's there that we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 27. We'll begin reading in verse 9. And this is Luke writing, who was traveling along with Paul. Much time had been lost, and sailing already had become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement generally happened between uh, the end of September, the 1st of October, somewhere in that time frame. And traveling by the sea was incredibly difficult from mid-September to mid-November, and it was impossible from mid-November to mid-February. And so they are at a crossroads of whether they will continue to sail or they will just hunker down for the winter in fair havens. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. So Paul, he warns them. Now, did he warn them through divine revelation? I don't think so. I I think that if that were the case, he would have said so, because in many other instances, and even in this passage of Scripture that we'll read, when he received a divine revelation to offer credibility to the advice he was giving, he said, I received this from God. But not in this instance. Instead, he is speaking from experience. He had traveled thousands of miles, probably, across the sea at this point through the different missionary trips that he had taken. And so he was very familiar with the seas and with the weather and the conditions that could come against him. Actually, you find out in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, which preceded this trip, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he had already been shipwrecked three times and survived. So Paul was an expert on the conditions that would cause cause a ship to run aground or to break apart or would cause people to end up on an island deserted hoping to get rescued eventually. Paul was an expert. And actually, the Greek word there, sea, Men, I can see it has a connotation of experience. In light of the experiences that I've had, I know what these conditions are going to lead to, and I'm telling you, we shouldn't do this. And he appeals to their interest, too. Notice where he starts. He starts first with the cargo, or he starts first with the ship, then the cargo, because that's all they cared about. And he's like, oh yeah, by the way, we might die too. I know you don't care about that, but that's probably what will happen. But the ship and the cargo, what you really do care about, it's not going to make it if we go. So what do they do? The centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot, who's the captain, and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, in other words, it wasn't a, a, it wasn't a resort that they were hanging out at, okay? They, it, It was a little uncomfortable for them. The majority, the majority being the captain, the owner, 
And the centurion, three to one, the majority in the vote, one being Paul, decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed their anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. They saw this as an opportunity to go. The wind was blowing in their direction. Now, what, what I want you to understand, though, is that this, this opportunistic, this opportunism of them, it doesn't make a lot of sense because this wind isn't going to last. It's kind of like 75 degree days in January here. Okay. Yeah, you might get one of those, but the other 30 days are going to be blistering cold. So you shouldn't put up your winter clothes, you might say, in January because you have one really nice day. just doesn't make a lot of sense. But they decided to go for it, take on this huge risk. And so they sailed along the shore of Crete. But the wind that was with them in the morning, I don't think it was with them in the evening. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force in this This word here, wind of hurricane force, in this phrase, it's where we get the word typhoon from. Like this wasn't just a run-of-the-mill storm that they were going to go through. It was of the equivalent of a typhoon called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. And they had no control over what was going to happen. The storm was just too strong. This challenge was too great. And you know what the lesson is? As I, as I read through that, what, what struck me was it all could have been avoided. Isn't that true with many of the challenges that we face in life? Many of the challenges can be avoided. Not all of them, but many of them can be. It's kind of like the person who loses their job because they don't show up on time. Is there, is, there any, is there any more ridiculous reason to lose your job than I, I just, I couldn't get there when I was supposed to? I don't know. I, and that happens. All avoidable. It's, it's like the college student who is about to flunk out of school because they party too much in the semester. It's not because they weren't smart enough. If they weren't, more, if they weren't intelligent enough, they couldn't have gotten into the school in the first place. No, no, that's not the issue. The issue is that they just weren't going to class or they weren't doing their work. It could have been avoided. It's like a 16-year-old girl holding a pregnancy test with her shaking hand. It could have been avoided. It could have been avoided. It kind of reminds me of, um, I mean, I'm sure none of you have heard of this. The sexual harassment stuff going on. (laughs) I mean, it's everywhere right now. Is there any of that stuff that couldn't have been avoided? I I don't think so. I'm not sure. I mean, Matt Lauer? I mean, are you kidding me? Nothing. And I read up a little bit on that. Nothing that that he has dealt with um, was something that couldn't have been avoided. And now he's going to have to stay out of the public life for a long time. I mean, eventually he'll come back out, I'm sure. But his wife's a mess. Who knows how this is going to affect the kids? All could have been avoided. David Cassidy. Um, if you don't know who David Cassidy is, God bless you. <laughs> if you don't, he was a member of the Partridge family. If you don't know what the Partridge family was, students, God bless you. <laughs> He had a, uh, he just passed away a couple weeks ago, and he had a daughter who had a very, he had a very complicated relationship with. Not because there were some personality differences, because he was never around when she was growing up. He even was quoted as saying, I was never a father to her. Never. And so when he attempted to reconcile as she grew older, it was a reconciliation that never seemed to happen. Again, a challenge that could have been avoided. And what, what caused these men in this story to have this challenge? I would point back to who they were. The first was the pilot, the captain. And that, I mean, a, a captain of a ship is a very proud man. He has to know what he's doing. There was no way he was going to listen to Paul, a prisoner, tell him what to do. There was the owner. The owner didn't care who lived or died. He just cared about the ship and the cargo. He was greedy. And isn't that what gets us in trouble often is our pride? It's an unwillingness to humble ourselves and to be open to how things could be better, how our views can be expanded. 
It's a greed, and it's not just a financial greed, but it's just a desire to want more, to want more of anything. And it causes problems that could have been avoided. And how could they have avoided those problems? By listening to sound advice. Paul was giving them good advice. We got our teenagers in here today, teenagers, students. You're going to have people in your life that give you advice. And you got, I know you know it all. We should get lunch. You can tell me about it. <laughs> but, but as you grow older, you realize how little you know. And you got people in your life that are trying to give you sound advice, how to date, how to go to school, how to make something of yourselves. So many of the challenges we face in life could be avoided. And this storm that they encountered could have been avoided. Begin, going on in verse 21 there. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sell from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. You know what he says here? I told you so. If somebody ever says, don't tell me you told me so, you can say it's in the Bible. I mean, right here, Luke 27, verse 21, Paul says, you should have listened to me. I told you so. But there's a condition to that. He says that to offer credibility to what he is about to follow that up with. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. He says, not one of you will be die, will die. And to that, they would have said to Paul, are you crazy, Paul? That guy over there already looks like he's dead. What do you mean nobody's going to die? What, what are you talking about? He says, not one of you will be lost. You should take up courage. Only this ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who will sell with you. So keep up courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. How many of you remember a sermon you heard eight or nine years ago? Yeah, they're kind of hard to remember. I get it. But I listened to a sermon. It was probably about eight or nine years ago. And I'll never forget the title of it. It was on this particular passage of Scripture. The Indestructibility of God's Servant was the title. Wow, what an awesome title. And the whole idea of the sermon was that you cannot, um, you, the whole idea of the sermon was that inevitably God's will will be done. God's plan for your life will be accomplished. That there's nothing that is going to stop that from happening no matter how great the challenge is and so the angel comes to Paul and he says you don't have to worry about your life being lost because God's got a plan for you and it doesn't have anything to do with the cargo does not have anything to do with the ship does not have anything to do with anybody else who's on the ship with you the reason that you're going to survive is because you have to stand before Caesar and like every other king and governor that you have stood before you are going to tell them my story Here's the point. God's will is always greater than your challenges. God's will is always greater than your challenges. I kind of, I'm reminded of Jeremiah. Some of you know this verse. Chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. It's plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God has, a, has given us a plan. And it fits in the midst of his big plan. Your small plan fits in the midst of his big plan. And it's not a plan to harm you. It's a plan to prosper you. It's a plan for you to do well and ultimately to give him glory. It will not be easy. There will still be challenges, but God's will is always greater than the challenges we face. It reminds me of a story that I heard Tony Evans share. Tony Evans, an African-American preacher in Dallas, Texas. I encourage you to listen to him. Uh, incredible preacher. But he tells a story in which... His wife and him are on an Alaskan cruise. And they take 30 or 40 people from their church and they're heading up the coastline and they encounter the, this great storm. And as they come upon the storm, the ship really has three options. It can go around the storm. It can go into port and wait out the storm. Or it can go through the storm. The captain, in this instance, decided to go through the storm. 
for whatever reason he had. He decided to go through the storm. Well, sure enough, it wasn't long before the ship was encountering 45-foot swells, 75-mile-an-hour winds. People are beginning to become sick. Dishes and other, uh, other kitchenware and things along those lines are falling off of tables. It's this huge mess. And Tony Evans' wife is not happy. She is mad because she's worried about the people they can, that she is responsible for. The people who are starting to get sick, who might get hurt, who, Lord willing, do not lose their lives, but possibly could. She's worried about everybody who's on this boat, especially the group that she is with. And so she calls the captain, and she leaves a message for him, and she wants to know why they're going through the storm. About 10 minutes later, she gets a call back from the captain's assistant. The captain's assistant says, Mrs. Evans, and she says, yes. The captain has two things to say to you. His first one is he's going to stay up all night long, so you need to go to bed. If you wandering around this ship worrying about everything that's going on is not going to help this situation at all. The second thing is this. This ship was designed to withstand a storm like this. In other words, the engineers who, who, who drew up the, the blueprints for this ship... The engineers and the, and the workers who put this ship together, they put it together with this storm in mind because they were not going to allow this storm to overcome this ship. They knew this ship would encounter a storm like this eventually. And this ship is greater than the storm that we are in. And what you have to understand is that the challenge that you are dealing with, the challenges that I am dealing with, that, that God's will is greater than those challenges. God isn't like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? His kid has a temperature of 102. I don't know. I mean, it's, he's been up all night long. I don't, I don't know if we're going to make it. God, my plan, God's plan, he's throwing it out the window. God doesn't say that. He doesn't say, I don't, I don't know what to do. You, you lost your job or... I don't know what to do. You've, you know, you're struggling with an illness. I don't know what to do. You're, you're, you're caring for your parents. It's getting hard. I, I, the plan, it's all, it's all breaking down now. No. God designed the plan for us with those challenges in mind because his will will ultimately be done. And those challenges are not going to overcome his will in your life. It just does not work like that. It won't happen. It reminds me of a woman. I met her about 10 years ago. Her, she's, her name's Garnet. She's about 95 years of age now. But basically the, whole, basically the first couple of years that I knew her, she would often make the comment to me, I don't know why I'm still here. I don't know why God still has me in this place. She wanted to go and be with her husband who had passed away a few years prior. His name was Art. And then, unfortunately, as her health began to deteriorate, her family had to put her into an assisted living facility. And that was when we began to see God's plan at work. Because as she went into the assisted living facility, and even though her health was deteriorating, she immediately, I mean, within probably weeks or months, she began to lead a Bible study. She was telling people about Jesus. She started to um, talk to the nurses about her church. And, and she immediately had purpose, and she was li alive. And even though her health was fading, and she's still alive, but, you know, she's in a very frail condition now, God gave her purpose in the midst of that. God's will was greater than the challenge that she was facing with her health. Reminds me of a seven-year-old child that I heard about recently. Her father had been praying that God would use her in a mighty way all of her life. Probably every day he said he prayed this. But the last three years of her life, she had been battling cancer. And so this father's prayer was, God, help, help to use my daughter. Use my daughter in a mighty way. Also, he was praying, God, heal my daughter. And it was through the course of the, the cancer and the treatments that, as the father would say, there were nurses and doc doctors, other practitioners who were incredibly inspired. They were inspired by her faith. There were family members who were encouraged to even come back to the church after they had drifted away because they saw how, they saw just 
how much they trusted God even though they were going through such difficult, such a difficult situation. And so again, one night, the father's praying, God, use my daughter in a mighty way. God, please heal my daughter. And again, as the father would say, it was, it was in that moment that God seemed to impress a question on my heart. Which do you want? Because I'm using her in a mighty way, or do you want her to be healed? Now, as far as I know, that little girl, she survived that battle with cancer. But what I know for certain is that God's will in her life was much greater than that disease that she was going through. God's will in Garnet's life was much greater than her health beginning to deteriorate. That God still had great things to accomplish through her, even in spite of those challenges. And here's what we, what we assume is I'm going through challenges. Oh, God, he's given up on me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't have a plan for me. And that's not it at all. As God is using those things, in many cases, he will give you a greater story and a greater purpose because of those challenges. And that's certainly what happened here with Paul. And we go on, beginning reading in verse 27. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They couldn't tell because the conditions around them, but they sensed it. They took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending... They were being disingenuous. They were trying to trick people, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. The pressure has gotten the best of them. They can't handle it anymore. They're scared. And then Paul said to the centurions and the soldiers, because these men were found out, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. And so the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. And here's what has happened, is the pressure of this challenge that they're going through has become so great that these men are scared and they're lowering the lifeboats because they're gonna escape. I, I read through many different commentaries about this, these particular verses and they, they each were commenting on how, just how bad that was to do something like that. Because in essence, what they were doing is they were going to save themselves, however many of them there were, and they were going to let the other several hundred people die on that boat. They needed that lifeboat. But once they lowered it into the water, Paul said, unless you cut those ropes, we're all going to die, or at least you guys are all going to die. God still has a plan for me. So the centurion steps in, he cuts the rope, and they continue on in their ship, hoping that they're eventually going to run aground and they don't all die. And here's the lesson that we learned about challenges, is this is challenges will reveal character and they will refine character. Challenges reveal and refine character, always. You will find out what's inside of you when you start feeling the pressure of a difficult situation. Uh, it's, maybe you didn't notice, I don't know, I hope that you did, but we, we did a lot of painting this past week. We had volunteers here and I would mention all of your names, but I know if I do that, I'll miss some of you. So. But they were, just, they were just going hard at it all week long, painting up and down the walls and all the trim, and it looks so good. You know, I, in painting, um, it's hard to change out a brush that you're using. And so what you'll do is, you know this, I'll go outside and I'll start wrenching out a brush if I want to change colors and try to paint something else. And so I'll go out and I'll wrench out, rinse out a paintbrush, and then I'll go back inside and get the color I want to go on the wall, the new color, and I'll start painting. But sometimes when I press that, when I press that paintbrush up against the wall, some of the other color starts to come out. The, the color that I don't want to have come out starts coming out. And then I get frustrated. I'm like, oh my goodness. And I have to go back out and rinse it out some more, purify it, cleanse it. And then I come back in and I'm finally able to paint with the color that I really want to paint with. That's what happened to us. When the pressure comes up against us, things come out of us that we, 
that maybe we didn't know were there, maybe we wish weren't there, and sometimes we'll just keep painting the whole wall with that. We get angry, and we, we don't ever step away from the situation and try to, try to get, get control of ourselves. Instead, we just allow ourselves, that situation, to just continue to deteriorate. We've got some addiction or some, some struggle of ours, and you see guys, they'll kind of fall off the wagon, or see women, they'll fall off the wagon, and they'll take a drink, but they aren't dissatisfied with one. They just gotta, they just gotta destroy the rest of their night, get carried out of the bar or wherever it is that they are. Because something is pressed into our lives, and it's triggered something, and something's come out of us that we don't like, and we just, it's what happens. Challenges reveal character. They also refine character, though, too, don't they? I mean, I think with this centurion, that, that he was very challenged in this moment to make a decision. Do I cut the ropes on this boat or don't I? And he made the decision that was best for everybody, and he cut the ropes of that boat and let it go. They, ref, they, they, they um, refine us. It's kind of like this. It's like a Pop-Tart. I'm going to compare you to a Pop-Tart, just so you know. So it's like Pop-Tarts. When I was young, I used to like Pop-Tarts. I'd eat them a lot. So I'd throw Pop-Tarts in my backpack when I'd go to school, and then I'd go to school, and I'd eat the Pop-Tarts throughout the day as I was hungry. And they were good. But you know how you make a Pop-Tart great? Stick it in the toaster, and, and you allow the outside of it to get all toasted up, and the inside of it becomes nice and warm. Many of you are good. I, I'd probably say almost all of you are, are, in, are in a good place, or you can find yourself in a good place, and you can do some good things. But if you want to be great, sometimes you just have to go through the heat. Sometimes you have to go through the pressure. Sometimes you have to deal with the challenges, and you have to learn to overcome those challenges. And that's how we get refined in this life. And so in the midst of this, these men's characters obviously revealed. I think there's some refining that's taken place. Verse 33, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you've been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. I, I mean, when you're going through challenges, have you, ever just seen, have you ever seen somebody's going through a stressful situation and then they just lose 15 pounds? And you're like, what are you doing? Like, what's going, how, like what diet are you on? Like, what's happening? And you're like, I just, I just don't eat. I don't even think about eating. I'm so stressed out. That's not a healthy response. That's what's happening here with Paul and these men is they're, they're, they're so, so overcome with fear that they're just allowing the situation to begin to control their lives. and They're not even nourishing themselves. So Paul says, now I urge you to take some food. You need to survive. I love that you need to. You need it to survive. And I would even say these men need to survive because God had a plan for them too. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. And eventually they would come around on, a, on an island. And then a little while, sometime later, the, another ship would come along and eventually rescue them. And as we'll find out next week, they make it to Rome. But what I want to see, what I want you to see here is that in the midst of this difficult situation that Paul was willing to give thanks. When you go through difficult circumstances, challenges, those all demonstrate, those all create opportunities to demonstrate faithfulness. Challenges always create an opportunity to demonstrate faithfulness. It's, it is when, when money gets a little bit tight Will you still continue to give back to God? That's, that's that faithfulness. When, when like me, you, I was just thinking about this, and I was, I was thinking about, it was maybe a week or so ago, and my little boy, he was acting up, and, and maybe it was a couple of them were, that were acting up. I'm not precisely sure. It kind of all just blends together. Anyway, so they're acting up, and I was very frustrated and angry, but in the midst of that, I just thought, man, that, I should just be thankful that I've got kids. It's that. It's finding a way to be faithful, to show faithfulness, to demonstrate faithfulness. Like that little girl is going through cancer. And because she had such faith in God and God's will for her life, that she was such a great, she was able to share just an incredible testimony to the doctors and the nurses and the other people that she was encountering and other family members. 
It's kind of like this story I read about this past week of a, of a young boy that was traveling by himself, seemingly by himself, on an airliner. And he's having a good time. He's eight or nine years old. He's banging his cars together and singing some songs and just messing around in the car seat, not in the car seat, in the, in the airliner seat. And, and next to him in that seat, though, was a woman who uh, he did not know and she didn't know him. And then the flight encountered some turbulence. And it was actually several minutes of turbulence. And the woman is incredibly uh, scared, petrified, you might even say. Uh, but the little boy doesn't even shake him. He begin, continues playing with his cars and having a good time there in his seat. Just As far as you knew, there wasn't anything going on. And the woman became frustrated. She wanted to know, how could he, she, she said, how could this boy have so much fun when we're going through this? And so she puts her hand on him and says, son, you need to stop. Like, don't you understand what we're going through? And then the little boy put his hand back on the woman and said, miss, my father, he's the pilot. And he went back to playing with his toys because he knew who was at the helm. He knew who was in control. And that's the same confidence and assurance that we can have in God, our heavenly father, as we encounter different challenges in life. And he isn't just the one who's at the helm. He's the one who has created all of it. He has designed it. And nothing that you encounter or I encounter is something that surprises him. No, he, he, can, he has designed a plan and he has a will that is greater than any challenge that we might ever, we might ever face. And in the midst of this, we have an opportunity to demonstrate faithfulness. In this life, I want to challenge you to avoid the challenges that you can avoid, to stay faithful in the midst of the challenges, to understand that God's will is greater than the challenges that we face, and to allow yourself to be refined in the midst of them. And as we consider his faithfulness, we only get drawn to Christ, who facing the challenge of the cross and our sin before him did not run from that, but instead took that cross to Calvary and demonstrated the ultimate faithfulness to God's plan and God's will for all of us. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll continue to worship. Thank you, Father, for your will for our lives. God, help us to be a people who understand that, that your will is greater than any challenge that we face, Father. Help us to understand that you are the one at the helm. And we have this hope because of your Son. And we give you this in his name. Amen.